Starting with an email from uh, Laurent in St. Albert, uh, Ontario. It's on activists. Uh, could you ask your guest what he thinks of this, of the pharmaceutical sector in generally, and of activists in particular? How does it compare to other large competitors? Is the recent pullback a buying opportunity? Now, activists was involved with, uh, what was the story there, with Valiant? Uh, I'm trying to remember now. That's right. Well, they were, they were trying to buy, uh, buy uh, Valiant. Here, here's, here's the thing on activists. First of all, the pharmaceutical sector we think is really attractive. Um, this is an industry that has um, moved from being more science-based to more distribution business model-based. Activist has made a business of making acquisitions, like we've been talking about, making acquisitions, tucking them in, cutting costs, and then using their distribution power to basically put more apples on the apple cart when they go out, out to sell their product. Uh, and they've done it successfully time and time again. So most recently they bought Allergan, it was like a $60 billion deal. <clears throat> again, investors are very confident in their ability to integrate these acquisitions. Uh, they've shown a very good history and there's lots of money to be saved in the process. Um, so we think it looks very attractive. We like the sector. Uh, healthcare would be one of our three top sectors that we're focused in. Uh, we like pharmaceuticals uh, in particular and activists basically has got a great record of doing what they're doing right now. So we think that the outlook is very good. It is something that we own in our portfolio. And that's quite a chart we saw there on uh, activists. It's all coming back to me, that uh, that big battle that the Valiant finally pulled away. Right. Okay, Natalie is in the Toronto. Good afternoon. Mark, thanks for taking my call. Mr. Bowles, I'd like to have your opinion. I'm debating whether purchasing either or, or none. <laughs> Visa Oh, I heard you speak about Starbucks. They both had their split, so I think the prices are attractive. I just want to know which one you'd purchase, if this is a good entry point. And if none, please tell me. Right. Thank you for your opinion. So, Natalie, at the, at the risk of being indiscriminate, I would buy either. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we own both. Uh, Starbucks, I think, is one that very clearly benefits. Uh, the consumer has spent the last you know, eight, nine months putting a few of those dollars in their pocket that they're saving on gasoline. A lot of the money has been saved. It hasn't necessarily been spent, but this is one of those impulse items. Starbucks is executing in their business. Uh, we think that they have a, you know, big tailwind in the U.S. market uh, and lots of opportunity for, for adding to their business. Certainly food is one that they're working on. They're selling through lots of different channels. If I had to pick one, I'd probably pick Starbucks, but on the other hand, Visa's transaction business is continuing to grow around the world. They also have lots of opportunities. So these are both growth companies uh, and uh, both in good sectors. Financial technologies, one we'll talk a little bit about today in another, another company, and Starbucks in the consumer sector. And what's your history with these two stocks? We've owned uh, Visa and we've owned Starbucks for much of the last three years. And do you still do hold pieces? Yeah. You do? Okay. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Kevin's in Peterborough. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, thanks for taking my call, guys. I was just wondering with uh, the pullback with CN, is this a good time to, to get in there or would you hold off? I'll uh, listen to your wisdom and thanks a lot, guys. I'll hang okay. up. So, uh, Kevin, the transports have had a little bit of pressure over the last while. Uh, the uh, Both CN and CP, I think, came with pretty good numbers considering. Um, uh, I'd like to see the stock get turned around. It's trading below the 200-day moving average right now. Uh, I'd love to see it trade uh, above 70 in the U.S. The Canadian investors looking at it, Canadian dollars, it looks, looks a little bit better just from a currency perspective. Uh, we like the rails in general, um, and uh, I do like both CN and CP. I'd just like to see the transports get turned around a little bit. They've pulled back a little bit as the energy's had a bounce over the last few weeks. Transports in general, and I'm thinking of the ones in the U.S. primarily, are they just kind of consolidating gains here, going sideways a bit, nothing to be that's, concerned that's about? That's what it looks like. There's been no real major technical damage. Um, you know, the, the fundamental numbers have been pretty good. Um, I think that there was a little bit of disruption for some of them due to the port, port disruptions in the U.S. For CN and CP, that was not an issue. Um, I think it's just basically consolidation, but there may be better sectors to focus on. You know, you only have so much capital. Make sure you're focused in sectors that are sort of in gear right now. Do you foresee a, sort of a slingshot effect out of the first quarter, out of that cold weather, and a, a, an increase in activity? I do expect to see a pickup through the summer, uh, and I do, do expect that it looks as though we are nearing the end of a consolidation phase in the U.S. stock market. 
Uh, interestingly, over the last few weeks, the Russell 2000 has been behaving much better. That's more broad cross-section of the U.S. US domestic economy than the S&P 500. So it's been outperforming, and I think that you're likely to see that as we head later on through this year. Okay, let's talk to Fred. He is in Guelph. Hi, Fred. Hi, thanks for taking my call, Mark. David, this tech here just dropped their dividend by two-thirds. And, you know, a lot of people use this reasonable dividend stocks for their retirement. And, uh, you know, they cut our pay by two-thirds, and you wonder if these boardroom guys are going to cut their pay by the same amount. But the main reason I'm calling, I think it was back in 08, 09, I was talking to you when they had that big downturn. And it, was, it went under 10 bucks. and uh, you were asked if, um, if you thought it was worthwhile buying. You said, no, hang on, because you think it's going to go a little further. And obviously you were right, but I wish you could comment on this. Sure. Well, thank you very much. So, so Fred, um, I'm going to step back and take a look at it through our lenses. You know, first of all, you know, we would do work at the asset class. Obviously, the money's getting put to work in equities, and we talked a little bit about that. We'll talk more. Uh, at the sector level, we look for sectors where there's been some macro shift that can lead to multiple expansion as we go forward. If you take the commodities sector, it looks as though 2012 marked a cycle peak for commodities and that we are into a period where money is leaving commodities in favor of investing in equities and consumer-led economies. So it looks to us as though uh, dollars, people from around the world taking their currency, buying dollars to buy the U.S. stock market, means U.S. dollar works its way higher. Generally a negative thing for commodities. Commodities industry went through a boom between 2000 and 2012 on the back of the growth in China. China slowed, Asia slowed, emerging markets in general have slowed. I think that we are likely to see relative underperformance for the commodity sectors going forward. And tech is right in the middle of that. So sadly, you know, cyclical, they're called cyclical stocks for a reason. They can go out of favor and stay out of favor for a while. I'm not saying there won't be short-term rallies. We believe that this energy bounce in the last few weeks has been a shorter-term bounce and not likely to persist. I would be very cautious of all the commodities. And you know, we are gonna see dividend cuts going forward, I think, in a lot of these stocks. More generally, uh, you've said before you've got lots of bells and whistles in your shop, and one of them is telling you that there's a lot of money flowing into equities globally, correct? Yeah, so we look at a very specific measurement. If you took a universe of 100 stocks, in a healthy market, as time goes by, more and more of those stocks should be performing well from a price perspective. That means money's getting put to work in the asset class. So we track the breadth of advance in stocks globally, in geographic regions and for very specific industry groups like for instance metals and mining. And what I can tell you is around the world in, in North America, in Europe and in Asia we are seeing expanding breadth which means money is getting put to work really universally around the world. Some, sec some countries more than others and there's some very clear winners from a breadth perspective in sectors. The commodity sector really is not one of those mm. right now. It's improving, but it's really lagging behind other groups. Right. Okay, David, let's take a break and get back to questions after this.